Tien Bien Phu was one of those critical battles that defined a certain course of history. If the French had won, would there have been an American war in Vietnam? What would it have looked like? You can't answer that question with a game. But I think you can get a better appreciation for and understanding of a historical event by playing a good game about it. Despite its historical importance, there haven't been many games made about Tien Bien Phu. But the ones that are available are great examples of how much history, mechanics, and balance in tabletop games are intertwined. They're very different games, but the way each one approaches the battle makes a big difference in how you assimilate the game's lessons, and, by corollary, the history of what happened there in 1954. Before we start comparing all these different war games, I think it would probably be helpful to just step back for a second and talk a little about what war games are, what goes into them, what the expectations are from people, and most importantly, what makes one good and another one not so good. Historical war games are entertainment, but they're entertainment for people who have an interest in history and want to interact with it in a way different from just reading a book or watching a documentary. It's a form of reenactment, although one in which you can change the outcome and hopefully not have to wear a uniform. It's equal parts storytelling, problem solving, and, hopefully, competitive entertainment. These elements exist in war game design as competitive balance, which means that a game played equally well by both players will result in a draw, historical accuracy, meaning that historical play should lead to a historically equivalent outcome, and evocative mechanics, meaning that things you do in the game are analogous to actions the historical participants undertook. This is the golden triangle of wargame design, and each of these is much more easily achieved on its own than in combination with the others. Competitive balance and historical accuracy can be managed by clever manipulation of victory conditions and asking one player or the other to do better than history. But once you start trying to create game mechanics that evoke the period you're representing, you're in danger of losing touch with one goal by stretching to meet another. When you sacrifice the mechanics to one of the other goals, you lose some of what brought you to the game in the first place. Historical war games have the disadvantage of hindsight, meaning that history has already separated the good ideas from the bad. After all, in a World War II game, if invading Russia seems like a really good idea, then it's probably not very good history. And that's okay! It can still be a good game. In fact, by playing the game and using the internal game mechanics to your advantage, you might be able to change the parameters so that in the end, invading Russia seems like a very fine idea indeed. But it's important to start with basic historical principles about the situation that you're modeling. After all, you need to know exactly what you have before you go about trying to break it. The most important thing about the battle itself was that it was a siege. The French had been unsuccessful in trying to encircle and destroy large numbers of Viet Minh troops in the Red River Delta close to the French strongholds because terrain and battlefield intelligence had always thwarted them. So the French decided to establish a fortified position in the wilderness near the Laotian border, supply it by air, and essentially let the Viet Minh come to them. It would finally be a conventional fight where the French could bring their superior firepower to bear. They constructed an air land base centered on an old airstrip which they upgraded and surrounded it with a number of fortified strong points, whose names became legend after the battle was over. The French assumed that they could keep their position supplied by air and that the Viet Minh could never deploy, much less keep supplied, the overwhelming force that would be necessary to seriously threaten the French position. After all, the Viet Minh were far from their own bases as well. Both French assumptions were spectacularly wrong. They lost use of the airstrip almost as soon as the battle started, and for almost the entire siege were dependent on airdrops of supplies and reinforcements, which became increasingly difficult to deliver as the ring of enemy anti-aircraft guns closed in. The Viet Minh had transported enough guns to seriously outnumber the French in artillery, and due to the combination of the thick jungle and the skill with which the Viet Minh entrenched their guns, not even French air power could neutralize this huge Viet Minh advantage. The French artillery commander, citing his own disgrace, committed suicide on the second day of the battle. When the battle was first joined, the Viet Minh used human wave tactics similar to those the Chinese had used in the Korean War, as they were being advised by Chinese military advisors. While the outlined French strong points fell, the Viet Minh casualties were horrific and they changed strategy to one of digging numerous approach trenches to invest the French strong points. This protected them from defensive fire until they were close enough to the French positions that they could overwhelm them in a night assault. 
While artillery caused many casualties, positions actually changed hands in furious short-range melee combat. The French fought for 57 days through progressively deteriorating conditions, but never broke and defended bravely to the last day. Any game about Dien Bien Phu needs to capture the slow constriction of the perimeter through brutal bombardment and vicious close combat, or it's really not representing Dien Bien Phu. Supply has to be a crucial concern, or the whole crux of the battle is lost. Citadel is a game designed by Frank Chadwick, published by Game Designers Workshop, and released in 1977. It's a product of a time when I think that people's desire for realism was satisfied by explicitly accounting for as many historical factors as possible. It came out the same year as Avalon Hill's original squad leader, and since we didn't have computer games that could track every bullet or even bead of sweat that a soldier had, people found ways to simulate history in ways that were good for detail and bad for playing. I call it gaming literalism. It means that everything that was in the battle or historical event has to be in the game. There are rules for spotter planes, partially overrun strong points, different ammunition stockpiles, aircraft altitude, individual tanks, varying heavy weapons calibers, airstrip takeoff patterns, flak suppression missions, Vietman loss tracking, daily supply expenditure, different weather zones, off-board anti-aircraft fire, intrinsic heavy weapons capability, and multi-step melee combat. That's a lot of things. There are even rules for French ammo dumps possibly exploding when a French artillery piece is eliminated during combat, and even about American cargo pilots who were surreptitiously aiding the French, but were civilians and whose contracts didn't include dropping loads in combat, going on strike as they briefly did during the actual battle. Crazy amount of detail? Maybe, but it's consistent with the whole game design. Units in Citadel represent French companies with colonial French in blue, foreign legionnaires in gray, Moroccans in white on brown, Algerians in black on brown, and Thai units in tan. Viet Minh units are battalions equivalent to four companies and are in communist red. There are also numerous support units including tanks, planes, artillery, anti-aircraft guns, and mortars. Units are rated for strength and morale and are reduced when they take losses. While strength goes down with casualties, paratroop morale actually goes up while foreign legion morale stays steady, and other nationalities suffer small or large drops in resoluteness. The valley of the Namium River, where Dien Bien Phu occupied the center, was long and narrow, with a majority of the French units clustered in the center and north. These strong points are faithfully represented in Citadel, and the Viet Minh units surround them, both with infantry and with support units such as artillery and anti-aircraft guns. The map includes the French strong point of Isabel far to the south, which held out to the end of the battle. Citadel's scale is really what sets it apart. A hex represents 200 yards, and a turn is just one day. Since the battle lasted for 56 days, that means a campaign encompassing the whole battle will take a long time. Each day you'll be moving a lot of units and using a number of complex systems. The melee combat system is a multi-step combination of odds ratios and morale, and the fire combat system, while really a straightforward tallying of fire strengths, is complicated by the fact that each weapon type has a separate effectiveness at a given range, meaning that the strength printed on the counter is multiplied by some factor from this chart. The most important factor, though, is how literally the designer takes his time scale, because any unit in the game could theoretically traverse the whole length of the valley in just one day, and turns are only a day long, there's no absolute limit on movement. In fact, there are no movement factors at all. Instead, movement proceeds until a unit hits a vulnerability point, which may be difficult terrain that slows it down, or somewhere it could be exposed. For the Viet Minh, every third clear hex is a vulnerability point, and units must stop there, where the French have an opportunity to shoot at them. Units that don't hit a vulnerability point just move to where they want to. All other units stop at their first vulnerability point, and opportunity fire starts. The Viet Minh units here are attacking strong point Isabel, but have to stop every three hexes and let the French shoot at them. The French have multiple artillery units that can reach them here, but each can only fire once during the whole phase, so it will be up to units from other parts of the battlefield to protect Isabel. French attacks can reduce or pin Viet Minh units. Pinned units are halted for the remainder of the turn, stopping them in their tracks. Once the French have fired, 
unpinned Vietmin can move to the next vulnerability point. These units move through successive vulnerability points until they are either pinned or move adjacent to a French unit. This one unit hits a swamp and has an extra vulnerability point, but the French have no guns anywhere to fire at them. That's the end of movement. Now the Vietmin conduct indirect fire. Vietmin artillery, though, are tied up on the other end of the map, so these infantry are on their own. The French can also conduct indirect fire, using these same artillery units that fired in the opportunity fire phase. French aircraft can fly tactical support missions, and the French spare three fighter bombers to support Isabel, as the more powerful bombers cannot attack enemy units that are adjacent to friendly ones. The Viet Minh take more casualties. Now both sides conduct direct fire, which here involves small arms. The French deal some more damage, but are protected by their strong points and take only a single hit. After all this, it's time for melee combat. You got all that? I want to remind you that that's just one small part of the battlefield, and there's all the rest of Dien Bien Phu to cover. And I didn't even go through the calculations, the chart lookups that it took to make every one of those shots. Plus, I didn't bring the Viet Minh heavy weapons out there because I wanted to give you a break. But just for one, let's go through a melee combat so you can see where the real action is. Although there are several combats we can do here, we'll stick to the one against the Algerians of Strong Point WM, named after the lieutenant whose unenviable job was to be posted there for the duration of the battle. Two Viet Minh battalions assault the two Algerian companies, one of which has taken a step loss. The third brown unit is a heavy weapon and is not involved in melee, although it did cause some casualties during the fire phase. First we calculate the morale. The French morale is 4 plus 3 divided by 2, leaving 3.5, rounded up to 4. The Viet Minh morale is 3. That gives the French a plus 1 modifier to their die roll. Now we calculate the odds. 24 to 5, and the Viet Minh miss 5 to 1 odds by 1 strength point. The French are defending in a strong point, which shifts the odds down by two columns to two to one. Now the dice are rolled. That's a two for the Viet Minh, and a three modified to four for the French. Units route if the opposition beats their die roll by greater than the morale, so the Viet Minh would have routed if the French had beaten their roll after modifiers by four, and the undamaged Algerian unit would have routed if the Viet Minh had beaten their roll by five. The damaged Algerian unit would have routed if the Viet Minh had won by four or five, so it is possible for some of the defenders to rout while others stay to fight. Neither one happens, so now we recalculate the odds column, just decreasing by one for the French plus one morale advantage. Final odds, one to one. A four. That means that on the one to one column, the French take one strength point loss and are overrun, while the Viet Minh take one strength point loss. Overrun? Ah, oh, geez. All right, now the French have three choices. One, they can retreat, but they have to go through a Viet Minh zone of control, so it'll cause a morale check. It may force them to rout. Two, they can counterattack. Since they got attacked at three to one odds, they're gonna counterattack at well, one to three odds. So that's not great, but their better morale gives them a college column boost. Or number three, they can call a final protective fire, which means they ask their artillery to bring down fire on their position. The French get the benefit of the terrain, and the Viet Minh don't. If the Viet Minh get pinned, you know what, just, never mind. Just just forget it. We'll stop here. But these things exist for a reason. I mean, the battle narrative of the Viet Minh swarming and almost overrunning the French strong point, the French desperately counterattacking and retaking the position, often at terrible odds and in close quarters combat with friendly artillery bracketing the position, these are all essential parts of the story of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. And it's perfectly reasonable to try and capture this part of the story with game mechanics. Unfortunately, in this case, there's so many mechanics, you often lose the storytelling. When looked at from a larger scale, the intricate mechanics of Citadel do end up telling the story of Dien Bien Phu by mirroring its rhythms. The Viet Minh benefit from assaulting all at once, according to their historical tactics. As they do, the French artillery is the first to open up. And now the French aircraft join in as the Vietnamese anti-aircraft guns fire. The rest of the French Air Force targets the Viet Minh artillery in the jungle, first with spotter planes and then with bombers. Once the initial position is overrun, the Viet Minh can switch to digging trenches, which protect them from fire as they approach the French strong points. That's if you play the game the way it was intended the way the historical combatants fought the battle. But there are other ways to play a game. As long as you follow the rules, you should be able to do 
whatever's possible. The problem is the Viet Minh artillery. Historically, the Viet Minh had a large superiority in guns, but despite prolonged bombardment, were never able to clear the French out of their strong points solely by shelling. But in Citadel, the Viet Minh can use their artillery to simply blast the French into oblivion. The two sides start close enough together that the range multipliers for the Viet Minh heavy guns are substantial. Because of the way the fire combat chart is set up, the Viet Minh can guarantee at least one French step loss with each shot, and often substantially more, against a strong point with just two 120mm mortars or three 105mm howitzers. At four hexes, the recoilless rifles can do the same thing. And the Viet Minh have a lot of all these weapons. The French strong points can be bombarded until there are no defenders left. The only way for the French to combat this is to try and knock out the Viet Minh guns through artillery and airstrikes. This turns the game into a war of stacks in a small part of the board, while the rest of the units just sit there and wait for the outcome. But there's a bigger philosophical point here, because the things that made the Viet Minh artillery so resistant to French air power and counter battery fire, namely the skill of the Viet Minh at entrenching and the wet jungle canopy which defeated Napalm, were both completely out of French control. In the battle, the Viet Minh were able to defeat all the French efforts at silencing their guns or disrupting their supplies. So, by including an entire game system around this that makes the outcome ultimately dependent on a roll of dice, you're essentially saying that the reason the French were unsuccessful was that they were unlucky. Or, another way to put it in gaming terms would be, they didn't roll high enough. And that's the flip side to historical accuracy. While doing things the historical way should yield a historical result, you shouldn't be able to take things that were impossible historically and make them happen without changing anything else. I mean, you could try to fix these things. For example, you could have the artillery only be able to fire in fixed fields of fire, which is the way it was in the battle, or also the way it was in the battle, you could have the artillery have to pre-register certain strong points, so you could fire at those strong points, but not others. I mean, there's ways of getting around it, but how are you gonna see if that works? You have to play test it over and over again. And I mean, really, how many times are you gonna play test a game in the last 57 turns? The most striking thing to me about the whole design, though, is that the designer, in his attempt to be as literal as possible and divide the whole game up into individual day turns, actually ignores the most important part of the battle, which is the fact that the French attacks almost always took place during the day, while the Viet Minh attacked almost exclusively at night. This meant that the French air power wasn't available when the Viet Minh were attacking. But by having each turn be a single day, and having both the French and Viet Minh play, and have the air and artillery both be able to fire as if unaffected by day-night cycles, makes it seem as if there was no differentiation at all. And it's interesting because this is something you wouldn't even notice in a game where the turns were, say, a week long. And this is actually how gaming literalism can make omissions seem more obvious. Because the more you try to break things down into individual parts, the more you miss the parts that aren't there at all. The mechanics can interfere with the game in more ways than one. In fact, sometimes the problems are literally mechanical. The stacking limit in Citadel, meaning how many units you can place in a single hex, is restricted to one battalion, represented here by four companies, six heavy weapons class units, and an unlimited number of tanks. Okay, let's see here. Do I have an artillery unit under this stack? Oh, I, uh, oops. Even when you aren't close to the stacking limits, you can have problems. The all-out French air assault on the Viet Minh guns forces the French to stack plane after plane in a small area. First because the spotter plane has to be in or adjacent to the hex being attacked, and also because the number of factors you attack with makes a big difference depending on the altitude. Then, after you've done that, the Viet Minh player gets to divide up his anti-aircraft guns in any way he wants, against single attacking planes, whole stacks, or any part thereof. Range, altitude, and type of gun all make a big difference. Each gun can only fire once. Then the French player needs to remember which guns he was attacking in the first place. Okay, I know that unit was in here somewhere. Eh. Nah. Ah, forget it. Citadel ignores a lot of the physical aspects of game design, which isn't surprising for a game designed in the 1970s because that's just how it was in those times. After all, one of the most common and popular gaming accessories was pair of tweezers. If you're not fumbling with counters, you're busy with pen and paper. 
Citadel keeps track of ammunition for the larger caliber guns, meaning that every time they fire, you need to mark it down. There is no track for this on the map or a player aid card, so you end up having to pick up a pen every time you shoot. Use three recoilless rifle units in a combined attack? Make sure to remember to charge yourself three ammos. You also gain supply each turn, which is separate for each caliber weapon. And when the French airdrop supplies, they need to keep track of each individual point they drop, what weapon it was for, and whether they made it through. Citadel is an interesting game with a lot of problems, but once I think were common to many games designed around that time. In fact, I think if you went back and played a lot of the really detailed games from back then, you'd find similar issues. The thing is, I don't think many people did, and the hobby was really different back then. There was no vassal, no internet, not a lot of human opponents around. So unless you were at a convention, I think most people ended up playing games solitaire. And when you're playing against yourself, it's a lot easier to get tired of the game and not stick through to the end, and then you never find a lot of the problems. Of course, there are advantages too. You don't have to worry that your opponent is getting bored because you're taking too long with your turn. You can roll the dice until you get exactly the result you want and nobody's going to accuse you of cheating. And you can get out your tweezers and make every stack just perfect. And that's okay too. I mean, obsessing over history with little cardboard chits? It's the point of the hobby. For our next installment, we'll look at a game with a very interesting history behind it, in a very different way, looking at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Until then, take care. We'll see you next time. And thanks for watching.